Ashanti. We are your favorite aunties, and we are so excited to be with you this week. We have a very, very special guest. I was telling him earlier that we probably need about four parts to really get all of his deep well of knowledge up to the surface for what we want to know. But tonight, we're going to focus on our topic, I am. Page means Hopper. I am the author of Healing the Wounds of American Slavery and the Movement of the Same Name. And I have two beautiful ladies with me tonight, and I would like for them to go ahead and introduce themselves. Go ahead, ladies. Rosemary Smith Coleman, and I am so excited about this show. I'm always excited, but it just gets better and better. I am um, CEO of Biblical Films and a lot more, but I'm here to give of myself. So just sit back and enjoy the show. Thank you. Hey, Auntie Janelle here. And um, I'm also a writer and I'm a songstress and a poet. Uh, but I want to make sure you remember uh, some your own experience is not necessarily the best teacher. Someone else's is if you listen. <laughs> and hi, Jacqueline. Hi. And I hi. also want to just take a moment, take a deep breath and introduce my brother. Mr. Gary Hardy Jr. Gary Hardy gave me a whole sheet on his bio, but let me just tell you my personal, my personal knowledge of him. I met Gary when my husband and Michael and I had a nonprofit organization that would go into the LAUSD high schools and teach driver education. Mm -hmm. And we would do that as a platform to get children involved or young adults involved in post-secondary options, what they're going to do after they graduate from high school. And so we would show them how they could afford college and university, how they could you know, get scholarships, how they could bring their grades up and improve their GPA. And I walked over to another room one day and I met Gary. And I think that our instant connection was our care and concern and our love for these students. And so we got to know each other a little bit there. And we've just been kind of following each other on Facebook and like that ever since. And he is doing extraordinary things, extraordinary, not just in the Linwood School District where he has served on the school board for you know over a decade, but his resume is expanding, ever expanding. So I'll give you a little bit more about him and then I'll let him share with you about himself. So uh, the things I want you to know, especially is that he is a seasoned policymaker. Mm -hmm. He has dedicated his entire career to advancing social justice and equity. We also have that in common. Mm -hmm. Over the last decade, Linwood has seen a steady increase in its graduation rates, outpacing the state average and reflecting the district's commitment to providing its students with the support and resources they need to succeed. He has implemented countless, well, I'll say countless, because it seems like every time I look up, you've got another innovative program running. And his work in the Linwood schools has been the model for schools across Los Angeles County, and I dare say across the state, if you're really looking closely. I'm sure others are looking to you as a model and mm -hmm. looking to Linwood as a model. Right. He is also the director, he has expertise in the role of being the director of policy and advocacy at the Social Justice Learning Institute. And he gets at the root causes of social inequity and social injustices. His commitment to education and community service extends far beyond Linwood Unified School District. He also serves on the Claremont Lincoln University Advisory Board and the California Association of Black School Educator Educators Board of Governors, where he previously served as president and was chair of the City of Linwood Personnel Commission. Gary's role as a frontline leader, a frontline leaders academy faculty member, showcases his dedication to developing the next generation of leaders. That gives me chills. Not everyone's up to doing those things, right? right. 
And as I said, for me, Gary, you are a national treasure mm -hmm. because you have taken the time to cultivate your skills, your expertise, and your experience. And you have been bold in your stand for children, students, administrators, faculty, school districts everywhere. Mm -hmm. And we're just going to dig down into this deep well of knowledge that you have tonight to understand our topic, which is school to prison pipeline. And so I would love to give you just an opportunity to add anything you would like to, to the introduction. And if not, then we'll just move forward. <laughs> well, I just say thank you for, for having me. Um, it's been too long since I've seen you. And, and like you said, we just came into this place of community that's really hoping to save some black boys, black students in Gardena High School. So it's, it's apropos that we're talking about this work because our work at Gardena High School was putting a stop to that school to prison pipeline there. Just an honor to be with my aunties. I'm going to say, hey, aunties. Hey. To <laughs> so thanks for having me here. Thank you. And so, as promised, um, our format includes that I will read from the book and I will share with the audience just for full transparency that I had planned on reading other sections of the book. But then when I really looked at the topic, which again is school to, pipe, school to prison pipeline, I decided to go elsewhere in the book. And so I'm reading tonight from page 190 and the wound out of the 10, right? Because I always do 10, well, we have 10 wounds in the book and then there are sub wounds. So this is under the main wound, masking and pretending. Mm -hmm. And the sub wound is bucking authority. And so I'm going to go ahead and take my time so that I can lay a foundation for this conversation. Bucking authority. The word buck derived from the 1300s Old Norse bukhar, meaning male goat. Mm. Then in the early 1800s changed to bokai referring specifically to a man of Native American or Negro descent. Can you believe that mess? <laughs> Through usage by 1857, the figurative meaning became to resist or oppose. Imagine that. Authority comes from the old French, Europe, where American slave owners originated. Autorite meaning prestige, right, permission, master, leader. We've got white Europeans who believe they somehow have the prestige, right, and permission to be masters and leaders over Native Americans and Negroes. Now watch this. Conversely, we have Native Americans and Negroes resisting that authority, refusing to be controlled or have others rule over them. This is how we get the term bucking authority. It is literally Native Americans and Negroes rebelling against white Europeans who think they have the prestige, right, and permission to rule over them. Wow. Just as there are both healthy and unhealthy forms of authority, there are times when it is right to follow the instructions and demands of authority and times when it is right to fight against or resist authority. We must discern and choose wisely or we just may buck to our own detriment. I believe wholeheartedly there are many instances when we should buck authority. A clear example is when the authorities are just dead wrong. Mm -hmm. I believe we should stand for what's right. Sometimes exercising a healthy dose of bucking authority can lead to great outcomes. It can restore dignity and self-esteem and in some cases can even keep us safe. But it is also true that there are times when it might not be the best idea. On our jobs, for example, misplaced bucking can place our livelihood in jeopardy because we buck or pop off at the wrong moment. We may misjudge a person in authority or reject the decisions they make that could affect us. Mm -hmm. Sometimes these snap judgments can lead us to inappropriate behavior in professional settings because we refuse to do what we are told. Hmm. There's something in the souls of Black folk, I believe, that is weary of following commands, especially from white people. 
and more specifically from white people who may be feeling a sense of privilege in lording their authority over us. It irks us. <laughs> Under certain conditions, it can make us very irritable and angry. We are no longer slaves, we reason. What should we do? What, I'm sorry, why should we do what you say? There's something in us that refuses to ever be enslaved like our ancestors at the whim of every white person we encounter. We may have an extreme wariness about those in charge of any situation, no matter what color they are. There is a phrase in the Urban Dictionary. <laughs> wow. Knuck if you buck. <laughs> <laughs> in essence, <laughs> it means to want to fight if someone offends you or prepare to fight if someone steps to you. Many of us are always at the ready to buck. Mm. on high alert. Mm. Do we need to retrain our minds to know the difference between healthy and unhealthy forms of authority when it is right to buck and when it's okay to be led? Absolutely. Many of us have received some pretty unhealthy training in how to, how to be with authority under which we find ourselves. I was recently in the women's restroom of a busy shopping mall in a kind of urban neighborhood. It's experiencing gentrification now. The mall was so busy that the women's restroom was completely out of liquid soap. In addition to my stall was completely out of seat covers and bathroom tissue. Mm -hmm. As I'm about to exit the stall, I see a mall employee, but I hear her first. Mm. I don't give a damn. <laughs> that lady upstairs talking about some red button under these sink I'm supposed to push fiddle up this soap I don't see no damn button and I'm not about to get down on my back on this floor to try to find it <laughs> hmm. let's examine this scenario she is at her job based on how she's dressed in a janitorial uniform complete with rubber gloves and standing next to a cleaning supply cart it's pretty obvious that her responsibility is to maintain the women's bathroom. She is loudly and pointedly complaining to the clientele she's been hired to serve. She is bad mouthing the lady upstairs who we can deduce is her boss. She does not have a clue who might be in the bathroom that might know the lady upstairs. Mm -hmm. Or if there's a coworker in one of the stalls who could report her. My main point is this, this sister is jeopardizing her livelihood because she's choosing to buck authority. The authority in this case is the person or persons in charge of releasing the check that will feed her and her family. And while I feel for her, I would not want to lie on my back in this restroom either. <laughs> As a consumer, I am annoyed that the restroom is not properly supplied and that this woman's attitude is the reason. <laughs> I have witnessed similar scenes many times, us on our jobs hired to do a certain task and refusing to do so. It comes from a lineage of being property, which mm -hmm. I describe in greater detail below and our refusal to be property again, ever. You can't tell me what to do and you can't make me. Now, a proper use of bucking is when we're told to do something no matter how much authority a person has over us, and it's the wrong thing to do. It's more than appropriate to buck when someone demands that we do something illegal or harmful to mm -hmm. ourselves or others. I was working for the city of Oakland during the Bay Area earthquake, the big one of October 1989. Fortunately, I was not in the office when the earthquake hit because it did major damage to our building. Mm -hmm. My colleagues and I knew the building had undergone severe damage. We received notification from the mayor's office that we were not to report back to the building until the mayor's office instructed us to do so. I was at home when I got a call. Not the call, but a call. Mm -hmm. It was the director of our department, my immediate supervisor. Her voice sounded weird. Mm. Something was definitely off. 
She proceeded to instruct me to report to the damaged building. She went on to say that our office staff needed to return to the building immediately to begin to move the sal salvageable machines, files, and office furniture to a temporary location. Hmm. <laughs> that didn't sound right. Mm -hmm. Using a barrage of questions, I determined that this directive had not come from the mayor's office. This woman was attempting to mandate this on her own. Mm -hmm. Through the loud sound of wheels turning in my head, I vaguely heard her saying something about hard hats, mm. moving through the space carefully and signing a waiver. Mm. Fuck that. <laughs> nope. <laughs> Not doing it. <laughs> I politely sidestepped that authority in the right tone and for perfectly appropriate reasons. I was well within my rights to do so, so there was no retribution. I kept my job and did it well until I was good and ready to leave. Mm. Wow. Bucking authority. <laughs> when to do it, it, when right. not to do it. And I want to bring up a term before I throw it to you. It's a term that I've been wrestling with for a long time. And Mr. Hardy informed me that it is a term that is very common in his circles in politics and education. And that term is willful defiance. Mm -hmm. Willful defiance. And it's used in many cases with children of color in particular, when the authority in their educational environments wish to channel them through judicial channels in order to handle certain behaviors. So um, I also brought up the DSM, which stands for Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders. Uh, they're in the fifth edition of this publication now, and it's published by the American Psychiatric Association, and it is full of diagnoses. Five, like how many pages? Um, they're up to... 954 pages now mm -hmm. of all of these labels. And I believe that there is a movement. I don't know by whom, which office, and I can't be clear about that yet, but uh, that willful defiance be added to this catalog. And so, ladies and gentlemen, given the reading and given the terms that have been thrown out here tonight, what say you, aunties and Mr. Gary? Well, you know what? The first thing came to my mind, and I know everyone knows the story, and, and it's, it, his name escapes me, but it was the young man that um, pretty much beat his teacher because she took the Nintendo mm -hmm. game away. And they did say in the beginning that he was special needs, mm -hmm. and then they also said that, you know, he was looking at 30 years. Mm -hmm. and And I thought that was like a contradiction also thought that it, well, he was tried right there mm -hmm. right there mm -hmm. so i just wanted to know um you know what what are your you know what are your what is your take on that on that situation yeah um it was troubling for a, a, lot, a lot of reasons of course obviously um the fact that the teacher was was injured um but I always uh had to sort of ask myself in that moment what happened before the situation broke down the way that it did. Uh, because with a student that is autistic, you have to realize the way in which autistic people experience the world is different from our way of experiencing the world. And, and one example that I'll, that I'll give you is in, a, in cerebral cortex for the autistic person, the receptors for pain and for audio are sometimes crossed or closely uh, related to where some sounds can produce pain, some light can produce mm. pain. And, and I, my assumption is that the student used his Nintendo as sort of um, a comfort mechanism mm. or sort of a safety blanket, uh, so to speak. And having that taken away from him um, set him off on, on, a, on, a, on a way that was sort of, um, you know, his reaction to, to not feeling safe, to feeling threatened, to having the thing that he was so beloved be taken away from him. And, and I have a nephew that's autistic and I understand what it's like when his video game isn't working or his phone is in charge and how mm -hmm. the rest of the world seems to fall apart because this one seemingly small thing um, isn't working in, in its favor. Uh, so I think that within that school system, something happened and broke down, uh, mm -hmm. what wasn't properly handled. Now, of course, violence in, in no form is acceptable, 
right? But you have to understand what's what's taking place. And I, and, and the issue with our judicial system, judicial system is oftentimes intent is not understood, right? So to charge a 16 year old uh, autistic young boy as a man because he might be six foot plus mm -hmm. um, is exactly what the issue is. And we're talking about the school to prison pipeline where black boys are often seen as older, more more aggressive, less intelligent, um, only apropos for sports and, and physical activity, um, only um, you know the recipients of you know tough love versus uh, the caring and nurturing support that, that, they, that they might need. So if I, look, if I look at this situation with all I know about the school to prison pipeline and what black boys experience and also what they need in school, um, that school system failed that young boy that day. Mm -hmm. and, you know. Um, Okay. I, well, I wanted to say, go ahead, oh, please. Say and, and, su and subsequently, I, I would say that the school system also failed that teacher by, mm. by putting her in a situation where she had to um, address a situation where she may not have been equipped to do so or didn't understand fully the needs of, the, of that student. Because if I were looking at the student's IEP, which is their individualized education uh, program, mm. I would understand that he might have needed a mechanism to keep him um, calm, that he had a safety blanket, and then would have understand there might be other alternatives for uh, addressing behavior that should have been uh, employed versus uh, taking the Nintendo away. So I think that when I look at that, I think it was just a failure on both sides. And mm -hmm. if you don't think he should be at charge as an adult, he should be charged to the level of his mental ability, which I, is I, far below um, his, his, his actual age uh, biologically. So I, I totally agree. But that's one thing that I have to get out is mm -hmm. because um, we're so used to judging each other yeah. and, it's, and it's only because I recently awakened up, woke up because of reading this book, Healing the Wounds of American Slavery. Had I not know the facts and not read this book and put the wounds together and read this book and adapted it in my life, mm -hmm. I would have judged that young man um, just because that's what you know just because i would have judged him because but i looked at it different program to do yeah yes thank yeah. you i and looked you know, at it differently. you brought up a really great point too gary about um the the age when minors are now charged as adults i think that that age went down to 16 last year yeah. is that true it, it depends on the crime but i think on the topic in general I, I think about tamir rice who was 12 years old when he was approached by a cleveland police officer and shot within seconds of the encounter is that it's statistically black and brown men are again seen as more aggressive and older than they really are right right and i say the word men because that's the way we always see society refer to our boys right. who are in their ad adolescent years so to understand the issue is to understand what's what's happening really where we're setting ourselves up for a miscarriage of justice right yes we're, yes we're the age of accountability for being tried as, as an adult where a system that already sees our young boys as older than they are, then we're already setting up our kids for harsher punishments and really being really placed on that school to prison pipeline. So I think that's what I always think about when I, when I think about situations like, like that. And mm -hmm. I feel like something else should have been done, right? Yeah. People often use the anomalies to talk about how we need harsher, more harsher penalties in schools for behavior. I'm like, but that, but the average interaction between an adult and a teacher does not look like what we saw with that young man, with a, a young man, a, a young boy attacking a teacher over a video game. That was right. an anomaly, right? That is not That's the right. current, which is why it was so jarring for us to see, right? So then we can't react from a policy standpoint and create policy based off of the anomaly. We must right. create policy based off of what happened on the generality, on right? Daily basis and account for the anomaly um, as and anomaly is right it's something that's going to really come around so i think that's one of the things i thought about when i saw this incident okay great you know what i wanted to make sure that we set our foundation and i'll go to you genoa we are talking about right school to prison pipeline and so i just wanted to get a basic foundation of um your understanding and description of what that is for those who are number one in denial uh, number two are ignorant meaning not in a mean way but just they don't know in the the literal word of ignorance and then for those who would um think that it's not necessary to even have this discussion right so i would like to go to auntie genoa first and then we'll swing back around to you for that description Okay, um, when my son was young, he was always big for his age. He was um, nine pounds, three ounces when he was born. Wow. 
and he was at the top of the the, the grade so when he was he, he was a baby and and when we would be somewhere people would be judging him just because he was he he was a big he he was baby here mm. but his body was big and so i had to while he was growing up i had to protect him from a lot of stuff because people that they're looking at him and they're looking at his size like hey what's this big kid doing blah 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 hey he's only this age he's 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 he's, he's a kid this body might be big but his mind is is the age he is he was a little kid and um i it, it the thing is and you're right about them treating our children like they're like they're older and they expect our children to understand beyond what some other little kids the right. other little kids is allowed to be little and and young because um i um i we do have an autism high school here and it's a whole uh, range and um and and you're right that teacher should have read his iep to see what was going on with him before she she did anything but because we're um they're skating around trying to get a bunch of people to be able to keep doing jobs they're they're hiring people that don't have the qualifications to deal with the special needs children not just the autistic children but also um, um others as well they don't exactly. have they don't have the qualifications and so they're in the classroom and then they already have the color bias going on so mm -hmm. that's not working for our children right and she may have been fully aware of his iep but just not been able to handle that situation not been i don't know equipped or educated or experienced enough whatever that is she just may not have been equipped for that that moment and again that's the anomaly so we want to stick to like the mainstream i'm so glad you shared about your son too because that is so much the case just mm -hmm. as gary was explaining and what you just explained that the minute that they see first of all it doesn't even have to be a big black kid it doesn't if it's a black male then there's automatically the assumption that he's going to be dangerous, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so Gary, can you lay that out for us? What is the school to prison pipeline? What is that? For sure, and I, and I do wanna say for the teacher in the incident that I didn't read enough about the incident itself to say whether or not she was trained or not. Um, I, I just think that a, a system-wide failure happened. Right? Got it, um, got it. That something took place um, or didn't take place that, that should have uh, predated or, or stopped that incident from taking place. Yeah, it could so, have been any number of factors. Right. The school to prison pipeline is a thing, right? Um, yes, it, it is. A collection of beliefs, policies um, that um, essentially over criminalize and over rely on punitive, uh, you know, discipline measures. Um, and it dis disproportionately impacts students of color, right? Um, mm -hmm. and, and the way in which that we can sort of define it is um, the more times young people come in contact with police, the more likely they are to end up incarcerated. That's just the, simp the simplest terms, right? Um, mm -hmm. And what this looks like is um, the term willful defiance that you, talk, you talked about, um, is that when police are called for willful defiance, then that student already is, is tracked in place in his pipeline for incarceration mm -hmm. and not for academic success, right? Because they've mm -hmm. sort of now been labeled um, by the school side. They may have to then at that point have sustained uh, a police uh, engagement, be it probation, be a police department, what have you. But the, the, the likelihood of them being incarcerated dramatically increases with each encounter with law enforcement. Um, and, and it happens when um, the school systems aren't set up to address appropriately student behavior. Um, what I know from my experience in working in schools is that student behavior is often an indicator of unmet need, right? Um, so that means that a student may act out in a class because they can't see the board clearly or because mm -hmm. they didn't before they came into cat in the class because they didn't sleep well last night because there was a shooting in the neighborhood or they're worried about where they might sleep tonight because they're homeless and that these these needs will present themselves in ways that are unsavory for a school setting right mm -hmm. and, our, and if we have the over reliance on police over reliance on punitive measures then again we're placing those students on this pipeline out of schools out of the academic success and towards incarceration so when you when you think about um students and the school to prison pipeline, you think about how students are in a pipeline already in a school system, right? They're tracked to go from pre-K to kindergarten to graduation and hopefully a college and career, but there are off-ramps on, onto other pipes 
mm-hmm. depending on what, what they experience when they're in a school system. And we know one of those is when they experience law enforcement, more punitive measures, then they are more likely to end up in an offering that leads them um, in, into prison or in some type of incarceration. And one of the basic things you can sort of look at is uh, graduation rates. Um, mm-hmm. Individuals that did not graduate high school are 79% of the folks that are in, incarcerated mm-hmm. in, in our society, right? Yeah. I recently did a presentation at a detention center in downtown Los Angeles, and that was what the education specialist or actually the education supervisor was sharing with me. And my mind was blown, although it makes sense. It just the number, though, is what I was blown away by. And that is the exact number he gave. Right. So from a school district standpoint, as in Limbo, what we did is we made graduation the default. Mm. So so you think about a, a pipe with a bunch of leaks, right? Yes. And, mm-hmm. the, and one, one of the cracks in the pipe is that the fact that students were not graduating. When I was in, in school in 2005, when I graduated, only half of our class graduated. Freshman year, we had a class of 1,600 students. In 2005, 800 graduated. Wow. Right? So somewhere along those lines, we had all of these kids falling out of these, this pipeline, going to various, various directions. Some of them, the school prison pipeline, some of them death, some of them substance abuse, and then the like. Some of them made it through and, and were successful without a high school diploma or achieved it later via a, a, a GED. But they think about how many kids were not selected or, or passed through to what our ultimate goal is, which really the basis and, and the default of what school should be, which is graduating through the, the K-12 system, right? So mm-hmm. in our school system, we, we sort of made the focus on our education program be the A through G compl- requirement. Mm-hmm. We aligned with the state requirements for graduation so that you were both by default supposed to graduate from our schools mm-hmm. and also be prepared for college if you choose to go to college, right? Okay. Not only were we trying to graduate, we'd also make sure that, make sure that college was your option, not mm-hmm. our failure. Got it. So and and this was for the Linwood School School District? Yes. Okay, mm-hmm. got it. Okay. And, and and this this is sort of the, my personal, one of my personal uh, uh, reasons why I believe so deeply in this work is because I remember sitting in that gym the first day of, of, of class, my freshman year in high school, and the principal literally said, look to your left. And look <laughs> no, to your not the look to your left, look to your he right. Said, in four years, chances are half of you won't be here when we're in the same room taking our graduation photo. And true enough, half. he was right. Because what he did was he gave half of us permission to fail and mm. half of us to succeed. Wow. And that is part of that belief system that I talked mm-hmm. about that propagates the school to prison pipeline. Because what you believe for kids is what they will achieve. Mm-hmm. Every now and then they'll, they'll achieve more in spite of you. But right. what you believe as a school system is what kids will achieve. And at that time, our belief was that some kids are just not going to make it. And right. that's what reality is. And like, their first, yeah. 800 but, out of 1,600 did not. At the wow. same time, like, if you think about it today, our belief is that you will be prepared to graduate high school. You have Metro A through G requirements. And if you don't go, that is your choice, not because we didn't get you ready to go as far as being <laughs> eligible to, to go, essentially. So I think mean, the change in beliefs made a big difference, but the mm-hmm. beliefs are one of the biggest, I guess, contributors to this pipeline because it has to do with what people believe kids are what mm-hmm. kids do and what they will will become. So can you give us an example then of, and then aunties, if you have anything to throw in here, you can. Um, but can you give us an example of, um, say a group of students who were prepared and set up with that positive belief system my, compared my, my, to a group like a placebo group that did not quite make it into that group and just tell us the differences and what you did with that the, the belief system, how you develop that belief system in those students that they did end up going to college and being productive citizens. I can think of a ton uh, because, you know, as you and I met with after school programs, mm-hmm. um, I remember when I was tasked to lead the after school program at Gardena, um, they gave us the kids that were falling with, with, within the cracks that were not on track to, to graduate, that were not coming to school, right? Um, that were credit deficient. But we came in there and put together a program that included credit recovery, that had some enrichment activities, that allowed them to, to do things that they that were fun. We had a PlayStation in there. We offered a snack. And then Ms. Hopper and your husband came in and had driver's ed. So we, we hooked them with the fact that yeah. they had something better to look forward to at school. 
right? Mm -hmm. And our schools and our kids in our program, our school programs were four times more likely to come to school because of our program. Wow. Being wow. I never wow. knew the statistics. It's, it's, it's alarming, right? What happens when you believe in kids. So again, we have these group of 20 black boys. If you remember, mm -hmm. I do. I, there, there's Rashid, there's, there's Devin. Um, I, the names go on. I, I remember these names and faces. Cause I remember they, they came to us sort of like, not Jahar, knowing, Sonny, yeah. Sonny, mm -hmm. not knowing Andrew Nash, not knowing what to do with their lives. Mm -hmm. And then in essence gave them hope, right? Wow. Cause they, they were tracked for a certain direction, but then we came and gave them hope, but also raised the bar because we also said, you can't just come in here acting any kind of way. Right. You right. Don't come and see me after school to play, play PlayStation. If you haven't come to school today. <laughs> <laughs> no PlayStation for you. <laughs> How that test go? And so what we're doing was disguising the learning. That's right. Mm -hmm. That's good. I like that. So we had just told them we were setting up for college and career. That that sounds like what they've heard their entire lives, mm -hmm. right? They sort of deselected themselves from. Right. right. But now we we sort of look from you know the point where I came on the campus at in November to, to June of that year, all those boys graduated, every single one of them. Because yeah. the system that we had about what they could do, and then we put the resources and people in place to support their development and growth, right? So, okay. and that sort of is what further cemented my belief in what a school system should do. So, right? where's your school? When are you going to open up their charter or something? I, look, I have 22 schools in Linwood, and I, that's that's more than enough. <laughs> so, There's got to be one with the Hardy name on it, though. I'm convinced. But, but, but no, but seriously. The, the, okay, so so then compare that to the placebo group. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So the, the placebo group are the kids that that I do in my my school years growing up that were not in the Gator Honors classes that that I was in. They were not in AP classes, and when we were doing our senior projects to graduate, theirs were not on. Their requirement to apply to UC schools. They were they were mm -hmm. not on research papers. It was like, oh, what are, what are your dreams for what you do after this high school? It was sort of just left up there, right? They didn't have SAT tutors. Right. They were going mm -hmm. to college tours and field trips. They weren't talking about whether a four year plan was going to be related to their their career. They were just sort of just getting through the system, right? Right. So one one thing we did in schools, um, you know, in that time we did what's called we tracked kids. Okay. Yeah. So on, only only certain kids were. Um, expected to succeed, right? So the gate honors AP kids were, okay, of course, you get college prep, you get an SAT tutor, mm -hmm. you get your you paid for, SAT paid for because you're going to go to school, we're going to send you to college tours, we're going to send you to college fairs and, and the like. And then there's the kids that were sort of on the bubble um, that were had potential but weren't, weren't quite the cream of the crop like, like so, quote unquote, we were. Then right. we're getting some more support of what the basic, and then the others were sort of just left to their own devices. Oh my gosh. Right. Right. And these are all in the same school, all, all in the same, same neighborhoods, neighborhoods, the same community. Same neighborhoods. And, and the thing about it is the only time I, I saw those kids was, was at lunchtime or at right. basketball football practice. Right. But they, they weren't in the libraries because we had different expectations to what, what they're mm -hmm. supposed to be. Expectations and belief systems. Auntie Janoa, okay. you had a question? Yes. Yes. Okay. So, because what it sounds like to me, what you're saying is um, they pick the ones that, that, that they could eyeball, that they thought would do something and they just let the other ones fall through the cracks. Now, um, I remember when I was in school, the, the, the thing was, it's not that I didn't, I, I had a lack of ambition, but if you don't have anybody to fill in those missing steps, mm -hmm. how are you going to get to um, where the other ones, where they have somebody, where somebody intervened on their behalf because they, they, they saw they, they're invested in them and and they just left me to my own um, devices. Like, oh, you figure it out yourself. You know what I'm saying? Oh God, and yeah. I, I and they're not going to do that. Yeah. Then and when that, I figure it out, they talk, they they say um they they label me. Oh, well, she was just lazy. Um, mm -hmm. she didn't do this. And, and but I I'm I, it's not that I didn't try. I'm missing some steps. And the person with the knowledge for the steps didn't pick me. Mm -hmm. Right. Or they'll label them ADHD or they'll label them on the spectrum. And the next thing you know, they're in special ed, even though they have high potential, bright students. Yeah. But yeah, that's that's what tracking is. Tracking literally is putting students in categories based upon our perceived um, outcomes for them. Wow. It, it, could, be behavior, it, mm -hmm. it could be test scores. Right. So in Limbo, we did a thing called detracking. We did what's called hetero heterogeneous grouping. Mm -hmm. We had kids of all abilities in the same classroom, right? And they're interacting. And, 
what, what we saw happen is the kids that were at the top remained at the top, but the ones that were on the bubble moved yeah. to the top. The ones at the bottom moved up as well, right? Mm -hmm. Raise the level of expectation as far as what is expected in, in, for these kids. And what happens is even in classrooms, people were, you were sort of tracked. And to your point, um, Auntie Paige, when we label certain kids with certain illnesses or disorders, a lot of it had to do with behavior. Mm. I can tell you, I was one of those kids that could not sit still in class. I still cannot sit still because of my, when my brain works. Yeah, was, yeah. That I was autistic or had ADHD. I function better when I can fidget or I can doodle. And when I'm done with work, I get bored and I talk, right? Yes. So, We're so, very much alike in that. Right. So, <laughs> That's why I was laughing, not because when you were, couldn't stay right. still, but I went, oh, right. that was me. But, but, but think about that. For a couple of years, my district wouldn't even test me for the gate program because of my behavior and my sister too mm -hmm. and my mom came to the school and demanded they test us because she knew us as a teacher and we both passed the test of flying colors mm -hmm. wow right but because so, our yeah. in, the, in the room didn't select us because of our behavior mm -hmm. they didn't to take or pass the test so in that case it took some some like parental advocacy it, you know it, and that can happen just in the village it doesn't have to happen under a parental care i mean if there's a parent that isn't able to be there you know there can be others assigned in the community to go and advocate for those kids i mean i'm just thinking of that as a, a possible solution just off the top of my head and i don't know if you you know there's any of that in place in linwood or if that's something that you know someone is working on or what's happening with that but that that's actually one of the, the functions of our equity and access division at our district equity and access and and uh auntie rosemary was asking earlier before we started about the village project and that sort of like folded into their their work because they're, they're advocates on campus advocating for uh english language learners uh, migrant students black students students with disabilities to make sure that they get specifically what what they need because to your point there's oftentimes a situation where mom and dad cannot come to the school mm -hmm. or they might by, by grandma who's disabled, or there might be a language barrier for, for mom who's a migrant worker who doesn't know how to read the papers and, and understand test mm -hmm. scores. So without someone on that campus being an advocate, then there won't be the proper intervention or somebody sort of putting the, their hand to stop the pipe from leaking to say, yes. I'm gonna mm -hmm. help you. So that's why the system has to believe in kids. Mm -hmm. That just really clicked for me. And, and, that, and that's what, from, from, from a policy standpoint, a department that is in charge of equity, access, and instruction, right, is a system that is believing in kids because there are people that are working at the district on the school site that are going to recognize the unmet need of students. That's that are right. Going to recognize that student needs an advocate. That are going to recognize that teacher has implicit and explicit bias. That our grading policies are not appropriate. Yeah. Right. That we've been tracking kids in, in, in a. In mm -hmm. a appropriate way like so like that's why when we even hire folks at district level like you know we, we know we can't teach you to care yes so we can hire the right people that, that have the right heart the system mm -hmm. or the, the lack of care that you might have or what you don't know and we can still make sure that we are not harming kids because i think this one example i'll, I'll give you is that um what our ready to learn initiative out of our equity division it's essentially an initiative to make sure that there are no barriers in front of kids for learning so they can just come into class and just be a kid yeah. And one example of that is our partnership with Vision to Learn. Vision to Learn comes out and, and they provide free vision screenings and free glasses. We had an elementary school in Linwood, we, we're still there, that is situated between two rival gang uh, territories. And that school mm -hmm. is the school that goes on lockdown the most. It's always having issues around the campus. And um, when this program came out to, to give students this vision screening, of 600 students at the campus, 400 needed glasses. Oh my gosh. And so, so that could be the kid that they thought was acting out just because they simply could not see the board. Exactly. So uh, so at that school, uh, you saw my, in my bio, I talked about our PBIS work in Linwood. Yes. That school is a platinum PBIS awardee school. PBIS, what is that? Positive Behavior Intervention and Support. Okay. So they are a, at the highest level of award for their work on restorative justice practices and addressing student discipline. Okay, and do they have both of those programs, Equity and Access and Vision to Learn? They have yep. both of those in integrated into their, yep. their program? So, so the, the, cor the correlation to your point, you, you sort of already pulled it out, is that a student could be acting out in class or performing lower than, lower than they should be because they do not have access to the resources they need to thrive. Mm -hmm. I right. can't afford so I'm going to just sit back here and act, and act out until you see me. 
Right. Mm -hmm. And literally, it could be that they thought they couldn't read, mm -hmm. but they just couldn't see. And, and if that teacher or the system doesn't believe in those kids, then how is that student that can't read then tracked? And they won't take the time to advocate for them because they don't believe in them. So it's a vicious cycle. Wow. Why this equity division is important to make sure that these guardrails are in place, that we're doing the implicit bias trainings with teachers, that we're training teachers on how to identify unmet need and how to refer them to services within our student health collaborative, which is made up of about 30 plus partners of just about every kind of resource you could think of. Right. Mm -hmm. Because if that teacher misdiagnoses behavior, mm. said that's a bad kid. Right. What what then is the response as opposed yeah. to saying that student missed four days of school. And when they came here, they were sleeping the entire time. Mm -hmm. I need to check in with that student or mom right. or dad. Right. There is some more need that we can help and support. We find out the student is homeless mm -hmm. and then they refer to our student health collaborative that can assist with, with getting them housing or into a shelter or, or what, what have you. Or in some cases, as a community, we come together and, and make it happen for those kids. So um, it sounds like you have a very holistic approach. We had um, an actual administrator principal mm -hmm. from Oakland mm -hmm. at Horseman School, a very good friend of mine. Mm -hmm. And she was explaining to us the same thing. It's mm -hmm. that we just need to have advocacy within the community in order to make the the holistic approach, looking into why is that student sleeping? Why is that student not able to read the board? Why is that student acting out rather than assuming that based on behavior, they're just a bad kid? One of the things I wanted to point out to you, and when I said, oh my God, I got it, it just registered to me when you gave that metaphor of um, putting a hand on the pipeline. Like literally stopping a hole in the pip pipeline. And it also gives us hope that any of us can do that. Mm -hmm. You know, some of us can stop bigger holes, obviously, with policy mm -hmm. and with ac access to the actual system itself, administration and otherwise. But some of us just in the community, I don't want to say just in the community, because yeah. the community is a huge part of this whole plan. But just to put your finger in the dike. Yeah. Just mm -hmm. look, I'm not going to let this kid. Yeah. Mm -hmm. the I'm going to personally take initiative with this kid yeah. yeah if we were in church we would call it standing in the gap right. well <laughs> we kind of are so we can call it that right so so, <laughs> so so again if you have somebody that that will not come to church with you but you're praying for them right 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 you are interceding on their behalf like they don't mm. they don't know to pray so they don't the know in our system don't even know they're poor mm. else because they, they could have only been familiar with their their current status in life. So it's like if we don't show them better, they won't they may not may not believe better for themselves. So like and if you don't know better, you can't do better. So when, when I ran for office, like I ran for office as the six year old Gary Hardy, <laughs> that, who's 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 who watched his dad almost kill his mom one day and and on on a weekend and had to go to school the next day and act like things were okay. <sighs> and that one is that one incident I couldn't fake it. And I go from this kid that was answering all the questions in the class to sitting there and not saying a word. Zoned out. And then when I, people were asking what's wrong, and I, I'm tired of being asked what's wrong, I throw a book across the room. Mm. Frustrated, right? At six. At six. But I, but I had a teacher that understood before this was even a thing, understood that that is not who he is. It must be an indication of something else. And she could have suspended me or mm -hmm. gave me detention but she pulled me aside and talked to me. Yes. Asked what happened. Give me a, a minute to cool down and vent. And then when she found out what, what had happened, she activated the school community. The principal, the RSP teacher, my speech pathologist, was pathologist, they all got to work because they saw the potential that I had in myself and made sure that they would do whatever they could to ensure that I did not fail. That is incredible. So, and that, that, moment is what I often think of when I hear about, you know, students in class acting out or the student that had his Nintendo taken away and just lost it. I, I, I ask questions because of what would I, what would have happened to me today if I had a teacher that just suspended me for throwing a book and didn't see mm -hmm. Didn't try to advocate for you. So aunties, I want to definitely because as I said, and now he's proving himself, that this is a man who is a wealth of information. And it's not just the information because, you know, anyone can come on here with information, but it is your unique perspective, first of all. It is your particular um, 
experience and, and your evolution through this whole system. And most of all, for me, it's your heart. Mm. It's your heart. And to find out that that was, that is the seed. That's the literal seed that began this whole uh, process moving forward for you is just remarkable. Thank you so much. So I thank you for being here and I thank you for, for sharing. Somebody said, and I want to get some more of these um, comments and remarks up because part of what we do here too, Mr. Hardy, is that we de we definitely want to hear from our viewers while they're here and get their questions and their comments and, and their concerns. So Michelle is saying she was sleeping in the classroom because she had a night cleaning job while you were in school. Wow. And you were warned that if you didn't pack in the job, you will be put in a children's home. Mm -hmm. So foolishly packed in the job. Was that foolish? Mm -hmm. hmm. Well, I guess you needed the job. Yeah. And and you know, that's, that, is a, that is a thing with kids. Go ahead. I want to say one thing before I forget it, because I think I just was reminded of the first time I heard about Wolf of, Wolf of Defiance in that term. I knew about it because, of course, um, educators sort of know about the, the, the idea of it. Mm -hmm. It was attended of Compton Unified there in Brawley. He and I were on a panel together. And he talked about Compton's work to outlaw Wolf Defiance as a reason for suspension. And the way that he described it was in terms of sort of what your book is, is seeking to explore is that those kids that come into the classroom with nothing in their backpack. And what mm -hmm. I mean, not the books and the paper and the pencil and the pen, but they literally have nothing else. Right. 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 They may not have access to food, water, shelter, clean clothes. Mm -hmm. They may be foster homeless youth. When they come to classrooms, all they have is what they bring in their backpack is, is mm -hmm. and the last thing that they can hold on to is their humanity, their situated <laughs> choice, right? So when you sort of rob them of that in that moment, what is their only recourse? Okay. Willful defiance. That's right. I'm That's gonna right. tell you no. That's the, and and when I was six years old, that was the last thing that I had in that classroom. Right. That so if I'm suspended for holding on to the last thing that I have in my possession, yeah. how is that right for calling the police, for suspension, for detention, for holding me back a grade, for mm -hmm. extra? How is that okay and, and appropriate for me holding on to the last thing that I have? If you if you tie it to slavery, what is the last thing that we had when we were enslaved mm -hmm. on the plantation? Our ability to say no. Now, what would right. happen if we said no was life right. or death? Right, but we're still right. in these moments where we're in these systems that were set up that were not for us. That's right. And when we have nothing else, we're we're just we're just saying no. That's all. We're just saying no. I'm not going to do it. I'm not. You're not going to use my body for I'm that. Yeah. Uh, it, while it was a violent act, we don't know the previous incidents. Thank you for a great show. You know what, Dy? Can you bring up? Uh, thank you, Jacqueline. Can you bring up Jacqueline's other uh, comment? She had something about respect, which is what I think this speaks to. Mm -hmm. it, and there is a famous model, a famous black. Uh, respect model that another author put together. And I might bring that into a show one day. She said it also has to do with feelings of disrespect. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's hard to take instructions or order from orders from someone you don't believe respects yes. you. Mm -hmm. And especially with black males, I mean that because of what happened on the plantations and it's still in our DNA and it's come down through the generations, you know, that you're going to respect me if you don't do anything else, because mm -hmm. I have no respect or the authority to protect and provide for my family as I should, or even legally be married to my mate. Yep. So you talk about the ultimate form of disrespect and being beaten and all of that in front of your entire community. And so that tongue lashing is very much like that whip lashing. Mm -hmm. And with black males that just aren't going to take it. <laughs> Here's Michelle again. Michelle's from the UK. I'm laughing because Michelle has a unique perspective as well because she's from the UK. And so a lot of the things that we talk about in terms of black, um, it, well, first of all, American slavery and our black people's existence and and um, our movement throughout this system, uh, our, our current day through the current day cultural construct. That's what I'm looking for. Mm -hmm. She she doesn't really have access to that. So she's learning just as we don't have access to what happens in the UK with black folks. Right. So bring up uh, Michelle's comment again, please, D.Y. It was foolish because I had a purse full of money. Oh, grade A in French left me totally penniless. Oh, mm -hmm. so you've got an A in French, but you had no money. Wow. Mm -hmm. that And what a trade-off for a kid to have to figure right. out. Right. Yeah, that that's too bad. And I'm sorry that that happened to you. Um, so we're getting toward that time when I need to go ahead and wrap. But I am just so privileged 
Mm. And so honored that you would mm. come and spend this time with us. I, it is going to make an incredible difference for one, two, ten, a thousand. I don't know. Globally, we don't know how far this video will go. I'm going to push it as far as it will go. And y'all know me. So <laughs> um, I just want to thank you so much for coming on, for taking the time. And mm -hmm. I want to first ask the aunties if you have like 30 seconds of a close that you want to do here. You know what? I just want to say thank you so much because I felt the, the, the just the passion and your experience. It was so heartfelt. And, um, and, and now, I, you know, I understand why you do what you do. And thank you for that. So, so just thank you. Yes. Auntie Janola. I just like um, what he was talking about. It's not letting the, the punitive aspect um, be the first go-to when you're dealing with um, children. Because the thing is, the, um, the, the dichotomy is the three-fifths human. Mm. So if you don't see my humanity, why? how are you going to help me? Right. And Mr. Hardy, I want to give you the absolute final word here. I just want to just thank you for even thinking of me being on the show. I appreciate you accommodating my, my crazy schedule. Uh, it's an honor to share space with my aunties tonight. I, I learned from you as much as you think you're learning from me. So I really just appreciate the, the, the chance to be in, in space and commune with you all today. But as you sort of were talking in our last bit of uh, time here, I think of Dr. Rita Pearson. And I, I listen to her TED talk almost every school year to get me hyped up to go into another <laughs> school year. And, you know, she talked about the fact that no significant learning will happen absent significant relationship. And, and, and the idea of that respect is the basis of relationship with, with students in our, in, our, in our classes, right? She also says that um, a student who is loved at home will come to school to learn. And a student mm. that is not loved at home will come to school to be loved. And I remember mm -hmm. in, in 2020, um, when we were going back into school virtually in Linwood, I shared this quote with our teachers because we were in a different sort of, you know, point in time where our kids were dealing with so much trauma. And so were our yeah. teachers, so were our staff. We're at the end of the day. All we can do is just show up in the way that we are and, mm -hmm. and, know, and understanding that that may look different to different people. But in this moment, it's about our shared humanity that was at risk because of a, a pandemic, right? And if we remove that from anyone, then it literally in that moment was life or death. And how much that is a type and shadow for what education can be for some kids, it is life and death, right? Life if and death. If we don't get this right, the outcome that we will have or thrust some kids to is a life and death situation where they may not have the situated choice to choose for their own betterment right so i so i just appreciate you all me, allowing me to reflect on my journey so far love to come back and talk about this more we haven't even got yes. to the yeah i'm um, telling you i'm telling you you have to come back for a part two three four yep, but i just yes. I want to thank you so much for what we always try to spread here which is hope mm -hmm. a healthy belief system and above all what you've said and what we've all said tonight is that children as well as adults, our entire village, as we're going through this healing process, we all just really need compassion yep. and love. Yes. Yeah. And so on that on that note, we're going to go ahead and end. And I want to thank our viewing audience for being here tonight. We have really enjoyed your questions and your participation. We hope that we've been able to address some of your concerns and your and your questions as well. And we will see you next week when we will talk about well, you'll have to tune in to find out. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, Mr. Hardy. And we'll see you guys next week. Bye. Thank you so much. Bye. Hey, Auntie. Yeah.